Uh, we made it through February. Well, we made it halfway through February. And uh, there's a few things that happen. By, by the time we've got to this part of the year, there's some stuff going on, right? Uh, number one, we had Valentine's Day, and we have Family Day coming up, and all of us are kind of on the border. Now, maybe, maybe you're a little different than me. Maybe this isn't something that uh, uh, affects you, but all of us are, many people are kind of hinging on seasonal affective disorder. That's, uh, that's where you start to get a little sad because it's just cold all the time and it's, you, you kind of dread waking up in the morning and you get a little tired of driving on icy roads. In fact, we were driving here this morning and on the highway there was um, a transport truck. I don't know when it went off the road, but they were pulling it out of the ditch this morning. They had that, all the stuff in there and, and I'm, I get tired of driving on roads where I'm not sure if I'm going to hit ice or if I'm going to have a clear road the whole day. And that starts to happen to us. But the, the other thing that tends to happen in February is a lot of us have kind of given up on our New Year's resolutions. <laughs> We've, we did, maybe we put a couple good weeks in. Real, you know, real aggressive. Yeah, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do this, and we put a couple good weeks in, and then we have that like one, one or two weeks, like a week and a half, where it's like 70, 50 to 75 percent. You know, I'm doing pretty good, but you know, I, and I, I had one of those days this past week. I sent Kelsey a message because I've been trying to eat healthy. I've done pretty good, uh, but there was a day this week that by about three o'clock in the afternoon, I'd had a couple slices of pizza and a couple tacos from Taco Bell. Like I just was like, you know what? It's cold, and I'm hungry. And as much as I've enjoyed eating salad and, and eating healthy every day, I really need some pizza. So I, I, I went. There's a place that I like near where I work that uh, has good pizza. And so I bought some. And then work got over. And I was like, well, I've already blown it. I might as well eat some tacos too. <laughs> so I went and got some tacos. Um, so that's what happens, right? But uh, now hopefully I can rate the ship a little bit. But... By this time of the year, we've started to experience, in some way, possibly, a little bit of a slip-up, a little bit of a failure, a little bit of a mistake, and, you know, hopefully it was nothing major, hopefully you can stay on track, but uh, the statistics tell us that by the time you get about halfway through February, most people have just abandoned the goals that they set for themselves. Most people, maybe it was to save money, or maybe it was to get healthy, or maybe it was to quit some sort of habit, or maybe it, whatever it was, that oftentimes when you start in the new year, by the time you get to sometime in February, it's sort of slipped a little bit. Maybe you're in that case. Maybe you're doing great. If you are, that's awesome. But we all deal with those kinds of things, those kinds of failures that happen in our life. And today we're going to talk about somebody who sort of was um, chronically prone mm -hmm to failure. Today we're going to talk about Peter. I said February, Peter, and hope. Peter. He had a lot of different things that happened in his life, and he went through a lot of experiences, and to be totally honest, we spent a lot of time talking about, I want to be like you, Lord. I want to be like Jesus. I want to do the right things, and I want to say the right things. I want to, I want to do it. But truthfully, I mean, if we could really be honest with ourselves, a lot of times, we kind of live more like Peter. Peter who, we're going to talk about a few things today. I had a little bit of technical difficulties. My iPad didn't charge, and then it was charged, and then I woke up this morning and it wasn't charged, and there was some things going on, so we had to kind of scramble to get it all together. So um, the slide presentation this morning isn't quite as smooth as it always is, but it's all up there. But we're going to talk about some instances where Peter had some mistakes, but before we talk about these mistakes that Peter had, I want to start off talking about the fact that Peter, well actually let's do this, let's, let's, uh, let's read this first passage of scripture, Acts chapter 2, I think we have it up there, yeah, Acts chapter 2 verse 40 and 41, then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation, and those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. That's a pretty good day for an evangelist, a pretty good day for a preacher to preach a message. And you can go back if you look at Acts chapter 2, he's got a whole sermon. He's, uh, that's, not, that's just the end of the sermon, but he's got a whole sermon where he talks to people and he leads them and he tells them about what Jesus had done and he tells them about how God wants to be a part of their life. And at the end of the day, about 3,000 people 
decide that they're going to turn their life. They were baptized. They were added to the church that day. 3,000 people, that's pretty good. That's a, that's a pretty good number, 3,000 people. That's a lot. So Peter is in this moment, in Acts chapter 2, doing something quite remarkable. Leading people to God. giving, Opening the door for them to have an experience with who God is. And, and they're being added to the church and they're being baptized and they're saying, this is, who I, this is what I want. God, I'm just going to let you be part of my life. I'm going to open up to you. And this is, this is from Peter. Those who believed what Peter said, he was the, he was the one speaking. And if we rewind all the way to the beginning, it's actually a pretty interesting experience. And again, there's a lot of scriptures that we can look at for Peter's life. He was one of the disciples. He was with Jesus all the time. He did a lot of things. He said a lot of things. So we're not going to flip through and read all of them, but I did put all of the scripture verses up here so that you know, if you want to write them down in your Bible or if you want to look at them, you can. But we're just going to talk about them sort of in a narrative this morning. But when Jesus is calling his disciples, Peter is one of the ones who leaves everything. He has a fishing business. I actually looked, tried to study a little bit about what kind of business Peter had. Um, not, it wasn't, there's not a lot of information about the kind of business he had, except that there is some evidence that he was a successful fisherman because he had people that he worked with. So if you were not successful, you typically fished alone. And again, this is just what I, what I read because I wanted to understand, you know, was Peter, when, when Peter said he left everything, uh, what did that mean? That he left everything to follow Jesus, that he left it all behind. And, and um, Peter and his brother Andrew had a fishing business. They had this uh, operation that they were relatively successful in because they were successfully fishing and they were catching fish and they were living off of it and there's some indications of uh, as you go through and, and look at different parts of Peter's life of what that meant and yet Peter leaves everything so before we start talking about some of the mistakes that Peter makes I want to be really clear Peter has amazing faith he was willing to walk away from what he had as a career, what he provided for his family with, all of those things, he walked away from it so that he could follow who Jesus was, so that he could follow after Jesus. It's pretty remarkable that he was willing to do that. It's pretty amazing to me that he was willing to step away from it. I have a friend right now, um, he was my roommate, Uh, I lived in Atlanta for a while, and and he was pretty successful. Uh, He was a uh, landscape engineer is what his position was. And uh, we were roommates for about a year or so together. And uh, he would wake up and he'd drive through, and Atlanta has this crazy traffic, and, and he would have to drive through the traffic, and he would get to work. And I mean, he made real good money. And I was, <laughs> I was working at a church at the time. I was interning at a church, and I was not making any money. And, and it was sort of like uh, some sort of comedy duo where he... <laughs> He, he was doing real well, and I was just like, you know, I was there doing my best. And, um, but anyway, we, we lived together, and we, we had to, you know, a lot of fun together, and he liked to play basketball, and, but he was successful. I mean, real successful. He worked in a big building, and he would go early and, and, and get all his work done, and he was, I was just always amazed at his work ethic, and, and he was really working his way up. And then a few years ago... Um, a door kind of opened for him to work with uh, an organization that is trying to stop human trafficking. And this is an organization that, it's called Destiny Rescue, if you ever want to look it up. And uh, anyway, so he started volunteering with them. And at some point that turned into no longer volunteering, this is what he was going to do. So he actually left this position as a as a landscape engineer, and again, I don't even know, in Canada, I don't think we have landscape engineers. <laughs> I think we have civil engineers, but in Atlanta, they have landscape engineers because it's summer all year round, so they don't have to worry about the snow, and they, they actually bring people in to engineer the landscape of, of places. But he left that position and started working with this group, Destiny Rescue, which rescues people from human trafficking. And, and now, and I, bet I showed Kelsey some of the pictures Now he's at the point, now when he left, he left a very good job to do this thing, to try to help people. Now he's at the point where he's literally speaking in front of 30 and 40,000 people. He's speaking in arenas all over the United States. They're in the middle of this tour right now where he's presenting and they rescue 
all kinds of young women who have been uh, caught up in this human, human trafficking thing. I mean, they actually, the organization he works for, he's kind of a spokesman. He, he goes out and tries to uh, raise funds and tries to get support and get backing. But they actually raid places. They have people that work with them who are ex-military and who are ex-police force, and they go into these places to rescue people. It's amazing, but so much of what he does now seems amazing to me. I, I look at these pictures. He posts some of them. It's these big arenas full of people, and it's him on stage with thousands of people. But yet at one point in his life, he had to make the decision, am I going to stay where I am, or am I going to step out and do what God's calling me to do? Now maybe for us, it's not that drastic of a decision. Maybe it's not this decision where I'm going to have to leave behind a business, or I'm going to have to leave behind this. But at some point, each of us, we have to make the decision, am I going to stay where I am, or am I going to step out in faith into something that I don't really know, but I'm going to do? And you know what? Maybe that could be this week. Maybe that's you talking to one of the elders about having a group at your home, a care group at your home this week. Maybe that's that's what it is. It's it's sometimes we get caught up in the big things, but sometimes it's just the little things. I've never done it before, but maybe this time I could host a care group, and I could bring some people into my home. And maybe that's and, and those are the little things that take place. But here we see Peter doing something pretty big. Stepping out in faith. So before we talk about some of his mistakes, I just wanted to set the table that he is a person of great faith. Now he has moments, he has failures, he has issues, but he has faith. And that's why I think more often than not, I'm like Peter. I mean, I'd like to be like Jesus. That's, that's, the, that's the goal. The one that doesn't make the mistakes and always does the right thing. But I know that truthfully in my life, I'm the one that sometimes I don't do the right things. I don't say the right things. I make the mistakes. I don't respond the way I should. But Peter wasn't just a failure. He was a man who stepped out in faith to follow Jesus. So let's go, let's go to the next slide. We've got a couple of scenarios here. So Matthew chapter 14. I just put sunk. Well, I didn't. Kelsey was typing. <laughs> sunk. This is the story. We've talked about it, right? Peter's out on the water with the disciples. They're on the boat. Jesus comes walking on the water and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me out. If it's you, call me. I'll hop over the boat and I'll walk to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter, again, showing that he is a person of faith, jumps out of the boat and starts walking on the water towards Jesus. Something none of the other disciples did. And things are going pretty good for him, but then... As the story goes, he gets distracted by the wind and the waves, and a little bit like we heard uh, Max Lucado talk about, he gets some anxiety. Oh no, what's going to happen? I'm walking on the water, but look at all the waves. This storm is big. And he takes his eyes off Jesus, and he starts to sink. Practically, he's sinking. But I think all of us can relate to uh, and, and understand what it is, that sometimes we get so distracted by what's going on around us, we start to sink. Start to feel overwhelmed. Start to feel anxious by what's going on around us. And Peter starts to sink. He displays great faith, but then takes his eyes off of Jesus and sinks into the water. That's, at Jesus' own words, a lack of faith. I think that the lack of faith was that he was worried that Jesus was going to let him die. He cries out, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. I don't think Jesus was scolding him for sinking in the water. I think Jesus was saying, you didn't have faith that I would save you. I was going to save you. But he sunk in the water. This is, a, this is something that Peter did. He had, a great, he had a great moment of faith, and then he had this failure. In Matthew chapter 16, there's a, a story where he rebukes Jesus. And again, you can write these down, you can look them up, you can do whatever you need to do, but he steps into this scenario where Jesus is saying, I'm going to have to be crucified. I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to, my life is going to be given up. And Peter says, no Lord, we're never going to let that happen. We're not going to let you die. You you can't die. You can't. That's not going to happen. And he's scolding and trying to correct Jesus. He's trying to tell him, no, this isn't what's going to happen. And Jesus very kindly says, you don't even know what you're talking about. Sometimes we get in that situation where we think we know better. Maybe even than what God knows. 
And Peter kind of puts his foot in his mouth and takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. In Matthew chapter 17, Peter lies about taxes. The temple guards come and they say, do you and your master, have you and your master paid the taxes? And Peter says, sure have. <laughs> yep. And then he goes back to Jesus and says, hey Jesus, I just talked to these soldiers. Have we paid taxes? <laughs> I told them we did, but I don't really know. And Jesus very kindly and very miraculously says, we haven't, but we will. Go and catch a fish. And that's the story of the fish that's caught with the coin in its mouth. Maybe you know that, maybe you don't. Again, we're covering a lot of ground today. We're not going to look at all of these stories specifically. But basically, Peter says, yeah, of course we have. He, he gets a little bit ahead of himself. Instead of saying, let me go check, he says, yeah, of course we have. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. And then he goes back to Jesus, and Jesus says, we, we haven't, but you can go catch this fish. Peter, is, these things happen to him over and over again. He attacks those who are arresting Jesus. That's in John chapter 18. They're in the garden. The soldiers come. Peter whips out his sword. Slices off the ear of the guard. Mulchus. And Jesus has to stop him. Whoa, we're not attacking these people. There's a plan here. There's things happening here. Don't do any more. And Jesus in that moment, you know, performs a great miracle. Heals someone. Peter just doesn't get it. He doesn't connect the dots. He's, he's already rebuked Jesus about being crucified. He's already told Jesus, no, that's not going to happen. No, we're not going to let that happen to you. And now he's pulled out his sword to take up weapons against the people who are trying to arrest Jesus because he hasn't figured it all out yet. Boy, do I always often relate to someone who hasn't figured it all out yet. <laughs> I haven't figured it all out yet. Peter, although he spent all this time with Jesus, he heard all the lessons and saw all the miracles and experienced all these great things, but he hadn't quite figured it out yet. So he attacks the people who are arresting Jesus. In Matthew chapter 26, this is, this is a real famous story about Peter. Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 33, and then later in 70 to 74, that's that story of Peter saying, I don't know who Jesus is. I don't know who He is. And he gets even more flustered and more, more furious and more upset as people keep saying, aren't you the one that we saw with Jesus? And he says, no way, that wasn't me. And then somebody else says, hey, isn't, I know you. You're the person who was with Jesus. And he says, no, I don't even know who that is. And at one point, a little girl comes up to Peter. And says, I've seen you with Jesus. And Peter just flies off the handle. I don't know Jesus. I've never known Him. I don't know who He is. Denying ever knowing Jesus. This is a step further even than that moment where he sinks and has lost faith. Even the moment where he's rebuking Jesus. Even a moment where he's going through all of these things. Here's a moment where he is saying, I don't even know the guy. Pretty rough run for Peter, isn't it? And yet, after all of this in Acts, we see Peter leading 3,000 people. What is going on? Peter had some massive mistakes, some big failures. There's more we could talk about, there's more we could focus on. There's more we could think about. But Peter had all these failures and all these mistakes. All of these issues. Misunderstandings. Times he didn't know what Jesus was talking about. Times where he overstepped his bounds. Times where he tried to tell Jesus, I know better than you do. Peter had all of these things and yet in Acts we see Peter leading people. In Acts we see Peter Helping people. In the book of Acts, we see over and over again, he's helping establish the church. In the book of Acts, we see he's working with the other disciples and, and establishing and, and writing letters and epistles and, and some of the New Testament that we have, Peter wrote, and all of these things are happening. And yet when he looks back on his life, he can see all of these failures and mistakes. 
all of these issues. There's three lessons that we're going to learn from Peter today. The first one is this. God never requires us to be perfect. And everybody said, Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. He's not requiring perfection out of us. He's not expecting you to be totally perfect all the time. Now, I will say, wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) I wish I was. I wish I was perfect. I wish I had... I wish I always did the right thing. I wish I always said the right thing. I feel like life would be a lot easier if that was how it happened. Maybe, I'd, maybe everyone would hate you. I don't know. I don't know what the result would be because none of us have experienced it. There's never been anyone who was just always doing the right thing, always saying the right thing, never faltering. If Peter, who literally spent days and months and years with Jesus in the face of a small girl said, I don't even know who Jesus is. Think about that. He had, he had seen Jesus turn the water into wine. He'd seen Jesus raise people from the dead. He'd seen Jesus heal lepers. He'd seen Jesus help people. He'd seen Jesus love people who were hurting. He'd seen Jesus do all of these things, and yet in that moment, he didn't even stand up and say, I know who he is. Peter was certainly not perfect. Now, I... I don't, again, I started out talking about how he left everything to follow Jesus. I don't want you to think that Peter wasn't a person of faith. I think he was sincere. I think he just made some mistakes along the way. I don't think he was doing it on purpose. I think he was faithful. He just had moments. He had times, and I think that's probably how a lot of us are. I think probably a lot of us here this morning are people who are faithful, but but there are times... For whatever reason, where instead of exemplifying faith, we exemplify a lack of faith. Instead of speaking up, we shrivel away. We don't have to be perfect. God does not require us to be perfect. It's one of the best things, one of the nicest things to know, is that he's not requiring perfection out of me, because truthfully, I wouldn't get there. You wouldn't get there. Now that doesn't mean we should stop trying. It's just the comfort of knowing that even when we fail, He's with us. The next point is this. Don't quit just because you fail. Peter had some failures. Some things that happened. Some times where he made mistakes. Times where Jesus had to correct him. I coach a basketball team. In fact, both my girls play on it. Why don't you wave to everyone? They love when I point them out. (laughs) I coach their basketball team. And one of the things that, as a coach, drives us crazy is when a player makes a mistake and instead of turning around and keep on playing hard, they quit. They make a mistake, and then they put their head down and give up. So we keep saying, just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you stop playing hard. Just because you've made a mistake doesn't mean you give up. Last summer, Amariah, she's the one in the black coat, who doesn't like waving to the crowd. The kids all do swim team. And They're all pretty good swimmers, and they win, and they have all of these things. But you know, one of the moments I was most impressed with her is we had a swim meet. I don't even remember where it was. It could have even been here. A swim meet where about halfway through, she kind of made a little mistake in her breathing, and she sucked in some water. And she had to stop and catch her breath. But instead of swimming to the side to give up, she swam to the end and finished the race. She didn't give up just because she had a mistake, just because she took a missed breath and swallowed some water and had to choke and cough for a second. She gathered herself and she finished. She made it to the finish line. We're going to have mistakes. Don't give up. Don't quit. We're going to have these failures, these moments, just like Peter did because we're going to be more like him. Peter who made some mistakes but never gave up. And it led to that moment where we see him leading 3,000 people to 
into the church, into a relationship with God, to have a relationship with Jesus. That's, that's what it led to. He didn't give up on being a disciple just because he made some mistakes, just because he had some failures. He could have sunk in the water and got back in the boat and said, I'm never doing what Jesus says again. I almost died out there. No, that's not what he did. He kept on, kept moving forward. The next lesson we can learn is this. God gives second, third, fourth chances. Ultimately, God will give you another chance. Another chance. Now, I do want to say that the failures that we experience in life can have real life consequences. The situations that we have, and whether it's moral failures or whether it's just practical failures in our life or whether it's uh, different kinds of failures, th there can be some consequences. We can make mistakes. You don't have to go far to find someone who's made mistakes and it's had some real life implications. It's affected their real life. It's affected what's going on. So there are real life consequences, but just because we've failed, just because we've been through a situation doesn't mean that God has given up. He's going to give us another chance. He's going to give us another opportunity. He never quit on Peter, even when Peter stood in front of people and said, I don't even know who he is. He never gave up on Peter. Gave him another chance. Actually, he gave him several chances. There's a great dialogue between Jesus and Peter where Jesus is saying, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. And He says, do you love me? And he says, yes, I love you. And then ultimately he says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you, Lord. And he says, then feed my sheep. This great dialogue, this great reunion between Peter who has denied Christ and Jesus coming to Peter knowing that Peter has failed. Knowing that Peter has denied him, Jesus still comes to him and gives him purpose. Just because we fail doesn't mean we've lost purpose. Just because we've fallen doesn't mean that he's taken that purpose away from us. Just because we have mistakes or missteps doesn't mean that there's no longer a purpose for us. And even with Peter, Jesus says, do you love me? And he says, yes. And he says, then feed my sheep. This is purpose for you. Purpose for you might be hosting a group in your home. Purpose for you might just be loving your neighbor. Purpose for you might be volunteering. Purpose for you, I don't know what it is because I'm not inside of your brain and inside of your heart, but I know that God is not taking anything away just because we're not perfect. Again, there can be real life consequences. We can do things and there's some practical stuff that happens. I think I told you the story. Uh, we did a baptism one time. And there was a lady there. and With all sincerity, she wasn't joking. She wanted to get baptized. And so we had the baptism tank full and ready to go. And She said, and God forgives me everything. And we said, yeah, he's, he's forgiven you. You're going to get baptized? She said, this is so good. I'm so glad I accepted him. I'm so glad I'm forgiven. I can't wait to be baptized. And she said, have the cops forgiven me too? <laughs> I said, ah, <laughs> I don't have the authority to tell you what the cops are doing. <laughs> right? There's real, we know there's real life implications to things, right? But as far as our relationship with God goes, he still loves us. He still gives us chances. And no matter where you are in your life, He's got another chance for you. He's got more for you. He's got purpose for you. That's why, you can go to the last slide. That's why I called it February, Peter, and hope. February can be one of the most hopeless months because it's snowy and it's dark and it's cold, and you gave up on your New Year's resolution, and you're just kind of getting sick of it. February can be rough, but there's hope, right? Hope. In a month and a half to three months, it'll be summer, because <laughs> we never know. 
Right, but we can look from here with hope. In fact, we were just talking, I was talking a couple days ago, I think Friday with the kids about summertime. Oh, what are we going to do this summer? We're going to have swim team and we're going to have campfires and we're going to have bonfires in the back and we're going to do all of these things and we're, we're talking about this is what this summer is going to look like because we've got hope. In the middle of February, it's nice to have a little bit of hope. I'm here this morning to tell you in the middle of your struggles, in the middle of your failures, God has another chance for you. There's hope. There's hope. There's more. It, just because you failed, Peter failed over and over again, but God kept giving him another chance and another chance. You've got hope. That may, maybe you've failed. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're going through something right now in your life and you want to turn and run away. Don't give up. God has another chance. He's not giving up on you. Another chance. You've got hope. Just like we have the hope of summer, you can have hope that He's not taking His plan away, that He still has purpose for your life, that He still has a reason for you to be here. Let's stand together this morning. I know that February is tough for us sometimes. It's tough to wake up and see the ice covering your vehicle. I have those electric doors on my van where I have to I push a button and the doors open. But if it's icy, you push the button and the doors don't open. And then when you start pulling on it, the door kind of does a weird little... So I have to like crash into the door to break the ice. And I like bang into it. I'm tired of doing that. <laughs> Like, I'm looking forward to summer where I just push the button and the door opens like it's supposed to. I have that hope. Today, I hope as you leave, you'll realize, yeah, I've made mistakes. I've failed. But God hasn't given up on me. He's given me another chance. And I'm going to use this chance to love people and care for people and reach out and touch people and help them and do everything that I can and maybe today, honestly, maybe today is the day to just talk to somebody and say, hey, I want to host a group in my house. I want to have a care group in my home. Or maybe today is the day to say, you know, I could be a little more helpful with the food bank, or I could volunteer at the church, or I could help do this. Maybe that's today for you. Because yeah, you might have failed and made a mistake, but there's so much more. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you that we have this example of a person in Peter who didn't get it right all the time. That's kind of who we are. But just because he had some mistakes, just because he had these moments in his life, you didn't give up on him. You gave him another chance. Just like you did with him, you're doing it with us. You give us another chance. You help us. You give us purpose. You give us meaning. You give us hope for the future. So today I pray that we would leave here with hope knowing that there's more, that we're not just stuck where we are forever, but that there's hope in our life, in our relationship with you, in our relationship with the people around us. And I thank you that you love us so much, that you care for us so much, that even when we fail, you give us another chance. Be with us as we leave here. Lord, we pray for all the things going on tonight, for the youth rally, for uh, all of the things that are happening over the next few weeks, Lord, as uh, we have somebody coming, a potential candidate, Lord, as we have all of these things happening, we just pray that you would receive glory and that you would receive honor and that your will would be, done, would be done as we go through and as we serve you and as we honor you, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be blessed today.